speaker if anybody's willing to volunteer. Okay, give it one more minute, we'll get started. Okay, welcome to the DHCP working group meeting, everybody. This is Wednesday at one o'clock, so good afternoon. A uh, um, couple of things. Here's the note well. For those of you who have not seen it this week, here it is. Your note, you're participating in the IETF. If you do not know what this is or haven't read this before, please go read this. It has a lot about IPR and other things. Before we begin, we need a note taker. I can't start this meeting until somebody volunteers for this position. Anyone? I'll do what I can. Uh, Thanks. I'll Thanks, Bernie. Yeah. yeah, I did start the notes. I just dropped the agenda in there, Bernie. So it, it, hopefully people can just fill in the gaps. Um, and yes, anyone who has it open, if you have thoughts, please. Group editing is always a good idea. OK. So on that note, you've heard from one, you've heard from both of the co-chairs. I'm Tim Winters, Bernie's remote. Hey, Bernie. Okay, um, so here's the agenda for today. Anyone want to agenda bash this? Uh, usual stuff we're gonna start with, the chair slides, then um, 8415, uh, self-generated IPv6 addresses, then mobile subscriptions and a layer two relay agents in cellular front halls. We only have an hour, so I am gonna to try to keep people mostly on time if possible. Okay, uh, I'll go over these. So the there's two documents currently that are working group documents and they're both presenting today. So that's always good news. You're gonna hear more about those. Um, I just wanted to note that the SR6 locator draft that was lived here for a while that we suggested spring take. They actually adopted it and they're doing work on it. So if you're really into that, go follow that working group. Um, they're gonna CC us when they go to last call and do all the right things that we want a group who's doing DHCP options to handle it on their side that they wanna use it. And then we can look for the DHCP messages in there. Um, I always like to stick a slide in here of all the related documents that have things going on. Two of them have presentations here today. So that's always good. So there's just some related DHCP documents links there. And I think we're off to the first presentation. Okay, I think this one's actually gonna be the shortest one we've done on this because where we're at is, and Bernie, feel free to say anything you wanna say here. Um, Bernie, actually, do you want to talk to this slide? Might be better if you do it. Okay. Well, I mean, the, you know, we've been working on this uh, update to uh, the DHCP v6 standard um, over the past uh, several working groups, and we've, you know, made fairly minor changes. Um, and you know, it's important that we advance this to full standard. At least that's been a goal for the working group for for quite a while. Uh, Next slide. So the uh, latest published version just included a few additional items. We um, made a reference to uh, not releasing any uh, delegated prefixes prematurely, i.e. before 
all of the um, lifetimes that might have been advertised to downstream clients um, have have uh, passed, so that the you know if you're releasing um, a prefix, you know, or the device knows that nobody else is making use of any of those uh, delegate you know subdelegated prefixes or and or addresses within that prefix, um, and it that was just a, a like a one or so paragraph change um, plus a few minor little corrections as well as as the um, you know in the o2 version there was the implementation status report that was added um, and at least you know we, we asked uh, Eric if that implementation status report was sufficient and he believes that it it should be for the ISG so uh, this is now in working group last call, um, and we really would like people to carefully review it. Um, again, the, the changes from uh, you know the the eighty four fifteen uh, RFC are fairly minor. I mean, if you do a diff between the current draft and uh, the the RFC. There are a lot of little things that come up, but most of them are formatting stuff just because of the way the the two tools, you know, the one that generates the RFC and the one that uh, is the, the XML to RFC um, generator uh, produces slightly different uh, text in some cases or formatting. And so that's that's basically the only the major differences, uh, except for our small changes to text and removing some of the text such as, you know, for the um, IATA support has been deprecated um, as well as the, um, the, the um, server unicast capabilities. So the client will always multicast now. So please review, give us comments because we hope to send this off to the IESG. Thanks, Bernie. Any, any questions for Bernie? Okay. Thanks, everybody. All right, Jen, I think you're up. <clears throat> yeah, you're up. Hello, it's me again, talking about self-registering Slack addresses via DHCP v6. Uh, since last time, we actually moved from 00 to 05 and went through the last call. So please don't say that ITF is very slow. We can move fast if you want. So uh, the main, like I think it was probably the biggest issue uh, raised during the last call, the, the reason why we actually talking about this draft now, is a valid concern was raised about excessive multicast. Because initially the draft was talking, suggesting that the client just retransmits the packets until it's either get an acknowledgement from the server or just do an exponential back off. So is, if there is no one listening, well, it will be a few packets. Uh, so in new version, we changed that, so now, the network infrastructure will give the client an explicit signal if the registration mechanism is supported. And obviously, yeah, if it's not supported, the client would stop doing this. Also, the probably another change I'd like to mention is the change which was already in the text in the last ITF, but I don't think we, like if talking about Oh, no, it was not there, sorry. So it was introduced before the last call. We slightly changed the registration, retransmission, and refresh logic to make sure that server always has up-to-date information about addresses. I'll talk about it in a second. But first, yeah, what changed in terms of signaling the registration support? So what we did, Ted suggested that we uh, use the information request message initially, like, uh, in send registration, first registration message inside the information request, and then fall back to already proposed mechanism. This sounds like kind of 
strange because we would have had two different ways of signaling the registration. So what the draft suggesting now is that before starting any registration, the client sends an information request message, the standard thing for stateless DHCP v6, and into an option request option, it will include a new option, which is like zero length Boolean option called address registration enable, basically asking the server, do you support this stuff or not? And that is standard information request. It sends from link local source address to all servers multicast. So nothing new here, right? And obviously, if the server supports that stuff, it will respond. And it will be an explicit signal for a client that it can start sending registration. And uh, as draft always been saying, registration ascends from address being registered. Right? So we're kind of using the standard mechanism to get the signal. So idea is, yeah, so the client must not start send, sending any registration requests until it explicitly receives the other reg enabled. Obviously, it will periodically resend information requests based on the timer proposed by the server, which means the client will be able to detect the changes in the registration support. So obviously, if no server supports the mechanism, no response, no excessive multicast noise, the client just shuts up. If all servers support the mechanism, client keeps continue registering as soon as it gets the first uh, reply. It might be a temporary situation when some servers on the network support this and some not. For example, wait, it might be misconfiguration or it might be incremental rollout, right? I'm obviously not going to add this to the all servers at the same time. Well, in this case, what draft says, as long as you get the, f you send a, a information request message, as long as at least one reply contains a drag enable option, it means that there is someone on the link who can listen to you, and then clients start sending it. Uh, if after, when it sends information request next time after a while, right? If it does not receive any responses, well, it means that maybe all servers disappears, right? So it will not send anything until it gets the positive uh, signal. So hopefully that's the best way of reduce the noise while still maintaining ability. So basically, yeah, we sing, we're sending a single multicast packet. Well, assuming there is no packet loss, right? And in one RTT, you're getting a clear signal if there is a DHCP server on the link and on the network and if it's willing to support. So basically, it's a simple stateless DHCP when you basically exchanging information request and reply. Uh, so I think Bernie suggested using the whole put the whole registration information into information request, so we don't need so we do not invent any new messages. Why we still prefer to do what draft does now? Because I looked at 84.15, it is actually must contain a lot of other stuff, right? So you cannot just send information a request with minimal uh, things, right? You need to put a lot of other things. Also, to ensure that information, registration information is not spoofed, we'd like to send information request from the address being registered, which means uh, we start sending information requests from global sources, and it's absolutely unclear what the network infrastructure might do about that. Some devices might be unhappy. Also, again, because information requests must contain a lot of other options, and the host will probably uh, would have many addresses, right? You basically start sending a lot of unnecessary things on the network. Also, again, with multiple addresses, we might potentially hit rate limiting. And also, if I read 4815 right, the registration re information request shall be resent based on the timers uh, provided by the server, I mean, in max RT, right? And it's not necessary the logic we want to use for refreshing the registration. We might refresh the registration more often or less often, actually. So I don't know what the group thinks about the current version, but yeah, please 
give us feedback. I think we sent it on the list. Uh, refresh and registration. I would please read the draft. It basically, it might look a bit like sophisticated, uh, but the idea is we want this network and the server always know that uh, if the ad particular address is being used, I mean valid, right? So we don't want the network to believe that address is not valid while the host is still using it. So host shall refresh the registration as long as the address is in use. We initially, the draft was saying, ah, just send it like when 80% of your lifetime expires and refresh it after 80%. But it's actually tricky because the host might receive an array which will increase or decrease lifetime of the particular address, right? So uh, what we're proposing is when host configures an address, it does schedule the next refresh to be sent at like 80% of the lifetime in the future. But every time it gets an array which changes the lifetime for some significant amount of time, not just few milliseconds or few seconds, right? Then the host looks, now shall I send it earlier or shall I send it later? How, what the new timer tells me, right? And if there is a refresh scheduled and the new array actually moves in sooner, then it will send it sooner, which basically means if I sent you initially a lifetime of like three weeks, and now I'm telling your lifetime is actually uh, five minutes, right? You will update the server. And if there is no refresh schedule when the uh, uh, array is received, then the host will just schedule a new refresh. So basically, and if there is no arrays for the particular prefix is received from now on, the host will just use the address, refresh it uh, when it expires, and then it just slowly dies. We also allow clients, when it follows that option, just if, if the client wakes up to update in one address or and found out, ah, I'm going to send another update in like 60 seconds, I'm not going to sleep, I'll just update everything just to save the battery. Uh, we actually spent some time drawing different potential scenarios and arrays and what's going to happen with the lifetime and refresh because you obviously do not want refresh to be sent every time you get an array because you might get arrays quite often. I know that my home router, one of them once tried to send me arrays every two seconds. So obviously it's not a desirable outcome for sending uh, registration refresh every time. So I know that the current text uh, has some things which needs to be cleaned up, as Bernie kindly pointed out. Yeah, I missed up the option name and uh, that behavior about reassigning information request and what to do with inconsistent configuration needs to be rephrased. I th we also saw Ayana uh, a review, but besides that, uh, I'm curious what does the group think? Uh, more comments, suggestions, or maybe another last call? Because I think the draft is rather stable and we address the primary concern raised during the last call. Anyone have any comments before we talk about the last call part of it? Eric Ving, the responsibility for DHC. I would prefer to do another working group last call. It's only two weeks. Yeah, no, 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 I'm saying like, work, enough, obviously it's what I'm asking you. Another working group last call here yeah, on the updated. The, the protocol is changing in a good way. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not saying uh, call the previous last call done. No, I'm asking, we will probably submit another version by the end of the week to address existing comments and maybe what people tell us now. And yeah, I, I'm asking for another working group last call on the 05, obviously. Yes. Or in agreement then. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. I think we all agree. I, I think we can do that next week. We'll wait for anything that you guys get this week and do any feedback. Bernie, does that work for you? Yep. Yeah, the only other comment that I would have, and it's just a clarification, is if you go back to slide four for a second. Um, yeah, there. You know, this if some server support the mechanism, right, is is a is kind of an interesting thing because you know it says well you know it, it it most clients probably when they get one information request are going to you know whatever first one they get uh, is the one they're probably going to accept they're not going to you know process all the information all the replies they may get to an information request 
So in this kind of incremental thing, it'll probably be random as to what whether clients will send or won't send because, you know, depend on the first information request reply that they get. I mean, I'm not sure that that's a problem because I think we, you know, it really makes no sense to have the two servers or multiple servers configured differently and it would just be considered a, uh, you know, network misconfiguration. So, you know, it is something that is, you know, you really have to have all the servers uh, configured the same way. Ah, okay. Yeah, thank you. Because I actually, re uh, what I looked in uh, 8415 and I was not sure, yeah, what's happened if you get different answers. I don't think yeah, the RFC actually clarifies that. So I was kind of assuming that maybe client can get one information request without an option and just do nothing, then get that information, uh, enable option in the next uh, response from another server and decide, oh, now I can do something, yeah. But I guess we can consider inconsistent responses or transition thing and just say, okay, until you get all your servers giving you the consistent answer, you might get inconsistent result in registration, right? Correct. So I guess, yeah. it's, I, I guess it's unavoidable in general, right, with any other DHCP parameters, right? If you get in inconsistent answers. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so nothing new here, nothing like particularly bad comparing to what's happening. Okay, yeah, I will clarify the text. Thank you very much. Uh, Tim has a comment, let's say. Hey, Tim. Hello. So, I, uh, Tim Chang, I think this is fine as it is. It's obviously been through working group last call. Um, my question is, with the DHCP PD to the host, I would presume a host would still have a, an address or addresses on, say, the Wi-Fi interface if this was a, my laptop on the campus network and it could use this, but what about the hosts that I'm tethering to or the VMs inside? Might those use this? And if so, what's the responsibility on the host then? Does it have to be a DHCP relay or how, uh, how, do you, how do you see this working in, in that environment or is that out of scope completely? Well, I, I would think, I, I guess it depends how you expand the network, right? Because I guess if you uh, use uh, bridging, for example, mm -hmm. Right, and you try to bridge the slash 64 behind, which like if you do phone with slash 64 and you connect Chrome OS to the as a tester devices, right? You will get mm. slash 64 with a bridging, right? Then I guess those devices, they don't know how they connected, right? They're getting Slack addresses. Oh, Lawrence, I can say something, right? You, do you have an answer for this or? Somewhat. Okay, good. Oh, no, I really like the, yeah, the like, PD no, I, host model. Like, I'm just wondering how this sits with that. Because yeah, I'm, so like you, basically if I, but if I understand you correctly, the host which is asking for PD might need to act as a relay. Yes. Right? Well, yeah. I presume uh, so. You, you could do that. Yeah, like, I, I guess... I don't know. Well, I it guess... Needs, it, it needs that functionality, presumably, in some way, if it's not... Yeah, like, I guess it might be addition to the host which is doing PD that they might want to act as a relays, yeah, for uh, this thing. I don't know, maybe it could be added. Strictly speaking, from tracking perspective, right? For accountability perspective, we already have accountability because the DHCP server knows that this client got that slash 64 and whatever is behind it might, because the idea is of PD per host is that we have something which looks like a host for the network, right? Mm. And what it does internally, not my problem. It might be virtual system, might be multiple, might be address per application, might be physical devices connected, mm -hmm. right? As a network, ad network administrators do not want to know what it is, right? They want to think it's a host. Yeah, so maybe it's not like, yeah, I guess host might relay it or might just, yeah, just use a uh, rely on DHCP server to log that slash 64 allocated to you, it's your responsibility. And what exactly, I don't know, like do you think, we I'm not sure if we need to clarify it here, though, right? I'm not like I'm not sure what. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. So uh, I think so. Th there is an attraction for sure in the case where um, I think I think it was Martin that brought this up on this. Um, he said, "Okay, maybe you have a PD to your host, but then you know, if I want to put something in DNS or I want to reach you, where are you?" And uh, you know, for that, we either you know, we either come up with some you know predictable ID like colon colon one, or more likely we do something like this, right? So, you know, um, Eric Nigren mentioned perhaps the idea instead of having the um, network um, provide you with a suggested IID so that they could sort of provision you or whatever. But yeah, regardless, like the interaction here would be, 
I, I think that the first top host, which is, uh, which is getting the PD, uh, would probably want to, you know, um, advertise their address um, in, via this mechanism to the network. The hosts behind it, I, I think sort of more to Jen's point, it, you could sort of, you know, pass this up or proxy it or whatever. Um, but in general, I feel that like the, 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 the mechanism, the, the metal of PD to the host is, you know, from accountability perspective, that's your 64. That's your fault, right? You know, that's forensically, this is for forensics primarily. And, you know, as long as I can blame one device for this as a network operator, I think, I think it's fine. Right? So we don't necessarily need to do sort of stuff like nested or relayed. Um, um, I actually think that if you're that, like, tested devices starting doing this and your host, which like will relay it, it might be, I guess, a problem because the network, like, what is this DUID? I have no idea who you are, right? I've never even gave you anything. I've never gave you slash 64. No. I don't know who you are because it's a, like some virtual system on, on your laptop, right? So I think yeah, it's a very good point, but I'm, I'm just not sure that this draft is the right place to do this, right? Or maybe I don't know. Like, we, would, we would minimally have to update the text that says, you know, um, the server must drop it if it's not appropriate for the link, right? So, you know, for example, we could say if the server knows that the prefix has been delegated to that uh, DOID or MAC address, and, you know, I think it, it could get tricky, right? Yeah, it does say a uh, server verifies that it's appropriate yeah. for the link, and I don't think appropriateness for the link is clearly defined as something the server decides, it's right? It's defined in some RFC, though. I, I think, think that is, yeah. Uh, yeah, but I, yeah, I like maybe, yeah, maybe we shall, yeah, say something about, yeah, what the, like, delegating host can do. But yeah, again, I'm, I'm not sure where. Somewhere, definitely, don't know where. Yeah, I seem to remember the, the DHB, the, the PD per, the HTTP PD for the host draft says that the host behavior is kind of out of scope of that draft. So it's not something for that, I suppose, well, and it's not something for here, but it, it, it's just nice yeah. to have some understanding of what that model can be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I agree. Yeah. So, uh, I think the, the uh, I, I think we can sort of just tweak the text that says appropriate for the link, and say maybe for, because in practice, if the server has assigned a prefix to that DOID and sees that DOID come back and say, "Hey, I've got this address," it could like put two and two together. So maybe we just tweak that text. For example, we say, you know, if it knows it's appropriate for the link as a, according to RFC, blah blah blah. I forget which one it is, or has you know knowledge that this is other. For example, contain it or prefix that it has delegated. Then you know. Uh, anyway, so maybe yeah. yeah. Okay, I, yeah take that to we'll, we'll I'm not. I think you probably want to leave it open yeah. for this. You don't want to close it, but I doubt you yeah, want exactly. to specify this because I don't think we're going to have enough reps or like, it. like via other means. Yeah, yeah. we can. Say. I, I think we can be vague enough, and if we want to define it later, we should. As for relaying it, I'm not sure. I mean, I definitely would like to have. You know, Android has this function where. If you tether, some Android devices have where if you tether, you can get the list of host names of the yeah. devices that are connected. And that only works for an IPv4. And so we, we copy the MAC address from v4 to the v6 neighbor cache entry and we match it up. But it would be nice to do this as well on, mm -hmm. on, on the server side for Android. I actually think that the idea is on the network side, the server already knows who is using those addresses, what physical device is using them, right? Client behind that slash 64, it has no idea if it's real slash 64 in the network or it's a tesseract. It might send this, but I do not think host should relay it because it will confuse the network infrastructure that those do ID never been seen. So maybe the host should just either drop them or log them locally if it wants, but definitely I don't think the relaying is a good idea. But, yeah. Okay, Thanks. awesome, right on time, perfect. Thanks guys. Um, we'll do a working group last call on that next week. So wrap up anything you guys have this week. think we're doing mobile subscription. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you just fine. OK, hi. this is Saravanan um, with the Comcast. Um, so today, we wanted to present our proposal to uh, enhance DHCP to include a new option to share mobile subscription info. Um, we can move forward, I think. Um, so this is, this is not so common today for everyone, but uh, for someone like us and maybe a few other MUNOs where the same operator provides access through both cellular and Wi-Fi 
and specifically Wi-Fi as a managed Wi-Fi network. Um, there is there is scenarios where users or subscribers move between Wi-Fi and cellular network, um, and 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 uniquely authenticate to the Wi-Fi network with PSK. So this is like a private Wi-Fi network, but uh, managed through the uh, operator by the operator. Uh, so we there is a need to get uh, the mobile subscription info associated with the use UE, uh, so we can provide service continuity. Like we can make sure the IP address is mentioned, session continuity is retained, and we also can provide enhanced experience based on their subscription and entitlement. Um, so the proposal is uh, uh, to define a new option. Uh, we call it as mobile. Sub, sub subscription info, mobile sub info, and and um, so this uh, the network that supports it, uh, the the UE that supports it will advertise that 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 UE supports this option, and then the network that supports this uh, functionality will will send a URI back in this option. The URI is a HTTPS URI, and the UE um, can validate this URI is authorized with the carrier config on the mobile UE. And then the UE can start the exchange process um, through the HTTPS. So the actual exchange of the mobile subscription info um, is, is through the HTTPS URI served through the DSCP option or, a, or an REA option. Next slide. Um, so this is how it works. So UE moves from cellular to Wi-Fi. It authenticates with the PSK uh, uh, key. And then uh, in, in the IPv4 environment, uh, we will use the DSCP v 4 option. IPv6, we can use either the v6 or the router advertisement. Uh, so this is inspired by the, uh, the captive portal RFC. Uh, so the op similar, this is similar to the option one on four. Uh, which was defined in RFC 8910. Um, so this is how we envision this to work in an IPv4 environment. Uh, so the client, once, it's, once it associates to the Wi-Fi network in the DHCP request, it will include the mobile sub-info option as one of the supported options. And then the server that supports it will send the mobile sub info in the ACK. The ACK, the, the, um, then, then the uh, client can decide if it can support this or not, if it can exchange the sub, sub info or not, based on uh, a pre-configured uh, uh, URI in the carrier config. And if the URI matches, then, then, then the UE knows this belongs to the same network, then, then the U can uh, initiate the exchange. Uh, so the proposal is that through HTTPS, the UE can do IPSIM, IP AKA. Uh, so, so only, so the UE can validate the network and the network can validate the UE both. Uh, IP AKA is pretty standard uh, for authentication. Can move to the next one. Uh, so on the network side, the DSCP server will, should be enhanced to support this new option. And it will include the URI uh, uh, in the DSCP act. Now it can include even if the, you, this, the DSCP server can always send this and the UE can ignore it if, if the UE does not support this. And in the IPv6 world, um, so we, we, we envision that the UE will include this option as a supported option in the solicit. And then, and then the, DSP, uh, the server can reply, uh, include the URI in the reply message. Um, if the if the UE supports DSCP v6, if it's not, then the then we will use the RA uh, IPv6 RA to the network will use the IPv6 RA to broadcast the support, but it will also include the URI in the RA option. Yeah, um, I think I think we covered this, and this is the RA option in cases where it, yeah. Um, yeah, I think you're good. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah, we can go. Uh, so there are some considerations. So there are um, one is like multiple SIMs. So so this is the dual SIM 
scenario. So what our proposal is the client or the UE will use the default data subscription SIM for this uh, uh, sharing the subscription info. And then uh, a network that supports this in V4 and V6, um, we, 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 we should use the same URI. We propose to use the same URI for consistency reasons. I think that's it. Okay, you got some people lined up to talk to you. Uh, Lorenzo Clidi. Uh, so um, I have a couple of questions. First of all, um, how would how would a host know when to send this, right? So let's say that you're, you know, uh, this is like, I think from Comcast, right? Or Xfinity. Let's say, let's say yeah. that I have an Xfinity subscriber, right? On the mobile side. Um, when I connect to Starbucks, am I going to send this? And so first of all, is Starbucks going to know that I'm, you know, that I do this? And then uh, second of all, is like, if I get the URI, I guess, you know, do that like the, 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 um, the, um, uh, the, the, the mobile carrier track the, the, the device or not? So, so first to answer the first question, how does the uh, host know that it has to send the info? So um, the the URI that's advertised by the network, we 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 propose that it be configured in the in the mobile carrier config, so the UE knows that this Wi-Fi network belongs to the same wireless network, so it can validate it, and only if it matches, then it can send the start exchanging the. Uh, subscription info. So you would want to always ask for this then? Right. OK. Yeah. And the other question is, um, in, sort of a while ago, we, we did a bunch of work in Interior for, for provisioning domains, right? And it, um, it, uh, it, it the sort of the authors and the folks working on that effort uh, asked themselves the question, what, what should go into things like DHPv6 and RA um, and what should go into things like the provisioning domain. And we kind of, you know, the, the, the folks involved at the time kind of concluded that the things that needed to go into, into DHPv6 and RA were like things that were essential to bootstrapping and things that could be sort of, that it was okay to defer a little bit later uh, would be, uh, would inst were instead better in the, um, in the uh, PVD information. Now, the thing that strikes me about this is that this you already have a dependency on an HTTPS URI fetch. So it feels like this should just go into the PDVD information and just put it there. Um, so, yeah. Got it. So Eric Link, no hat. And thanks, Lorenzo, you're asking the question I was about to ask, especially on the PVD and, and the privacy aspect. Uh, now, the only remaining questions I have, why not doing this on the Wi-Fi layer two in the beacon and so on? Because you can advertise a lot of things in layer 2.11. Um, so that that's something we, I mean, that's not my expertise, uh, the layer 1. Uh, so we, we really have not considered it. But yeah, if, if we are open to considering that, if, if there's if such a question. a presentation done by a commercial company or commercial alliance called Open Roaming in Madinas, La Previous IETF. They were doing something very, very similar. OK. Like, and don't count to get too many options into the array, else my friend Eric will get a heart attack. <laughs> you, you will find some code in Android that enables disables DHPv6 options based on specific DHPv4 options based on um, specific information elements in the beacon. And so there's there's a lot of precedent for what Eric was saying. Right? So you could put this in the beacon. And, and then you don't have uh, Hi, Pedro Zadraga from IEC. I'm the IT newbie, so sorry if I'm talking nonsense. I just have uh, one small comment. Um, I've read the draft. And uh, about the client behavior 2.1, uh, uh, it looks like it's uh, very specific about the v4 uh, client, but it is missing the v6 case. So I think it would be nice to just add it like uh, in case of v4. Thanks. OK, thank you. David Lamparter. Uh, I'm just converting some of the previous comments into the bureaucratic equivalent. Uh, your uh, draft does not currently have a privacy consideration section. If I'm looking at the right version, uh, you really need a privacy consideration section in your draft. We'll update that. Okay. So um, I, I, I can't see how I can add myself to the queue. So um, 
Go ahead, Bernie. I can hear you. Okay. Um, you know, one of the big questions is where should this work be done, right? And this may be something, you know, we, we can discuss more with Eric, but, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, this is a fairly simple option in terms of DHCP, right? It's just a you know, <laughs> classic data option, send it in the ORO or parameter request list, and the server sends it if it's got it configured. Um, so the, the, and, you know, there may be more issues with things like the routing advertisement and stuff like that. So I'm not sure, you know, for, for, for the DHC working group, this doesn't seem like it needs to be done here. And so, you know, should this be done in six man or, or where is an open discussion that I think we need to have with, with uh, Eric and, and uh, you know, to see where, where does this land? I had similar thoughts, Bernie. You read my mind. OK, thank you. Thank you. OK, last presentation. Hello. <clears throat> I think that'll work. Hello, Claudio Bafiri, Ericsson, and uh, here I'm talking about something that uh, may be interesting for you. It is the front hall uh, network. This is the front hall network, and, and it, is, uh, uh, it has been defined uh, in the scope of open run. It will be applied, it applies to the fifth generation and sixth generation of uh, the mobile network. And uh, it is based on protocols being defined by the CIPRI. Uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, CIPRI is a working group that works on this low level protocol that are not really based on IP. Uh, this, uh, the problem that comes with this uh, type of uh, network actually is that uh, in order to configure properly, the device in the left part, there are the transceiver. The node that is controlling them, that here in this slide is called BB, that is baseband, needs to know on uh, how they are to connected from a topology perspective. So in order to properly set up RTX1, the, it know, needs to know that it is connected on the port one of the first layer to switch and that is connected on port one on the switch number X3 so that it can properly send the configuration data. This works pretty well with the DHCPv6 because the DHCPv6 has the layer to relay agent or the lightweight DHCP relay agent that pro for properly forwards the information to the server. So the server knows exactly all the topology of the, of the frontal network. But uh, uh, unfortunately, a number of years ago, the layer to relay agent for a DHCP before, or the, the DHCP, the legacy DHCP, has not been uh, converted into an RFC. So this uh, frontal network configuration works pretty well in uh, IPv6, but not on IPv4. Uh, Specifically, uh, in the SCPv4, we don't have uh, support for the hierarchy on the relay agent. So only one RIO can be a uh, part of a uh, DHCP request. Uh, it does not been decided which of the attribute can carry the information for the topology. So there is some something that potentially can do that, but it's not stated this must be used. And then uh, it is missing uh, the specification on how to employ the relay agent in the layer two network. Uh, why we have written this draft? The objective with this draft is to reopen the possibility to extend the, the legacy DHCP for supporting the layer two relay agent the same way as it is in DHCP v6. And that is more or less all from my perspective, so. Okay.
Anybody have any comments on this? Eric Vink, um, no specific yet at all. I, I just wonder whether DHCP is the right protocol to do this rather than something else. Yeah, I, I don't know. But yeah, I don't yeah. think it, it really belongs in DHC. No, DHCP is a very smart way for doing that because uh, in DHCP v6, uh, you have the information in the proper position that can be queried. Uh, and then uh, all the standard works pretty well. So this works already like wished in the ACPv6. It's not on the ACPv4. I, I don't know. There might be some other very good idea on how to solve the problem. But uh, there is something called, if you dial layer two, guessing, right? It's not my, my area expertise. If there is a layer two network, there must be a spanning tree somewhere and somebody having access to the spanning tree, right? Uh, but uh, here it is a matter of, the, of knowing the, the physical information about more than a spanning tree. So you, you can do, you can define a number of level of VLAN on the front uh, or uh, the, we have quite a number of VLAN being involved. But what is important is the physical cable here. There is no way for identifying a cable. That's, Okay, I'm trusting you, but yeah, I know it's a very special, it's a very corner network, that one. But this is the, the network that we will have in the future in the mobile communication. Yeah, so this question. So I'm one of the authors of 60 to 21. Like, so I understand the problem. And yes, I, I, I think there might be better solutions, but I think DHC is like a potential candidate solution here. And um, we, we have this for DHCPv6. It actually works, right? The whole thing will work for DHCPv6. And I don't know, Bernie, you might remember this, like, because I don't remember, like, about 10 years ago, we actually had a working group draft, like, doing this um, for the uh, L2RA. Like, I think it was, like, maybe Vishwas or somebody who worked on it, and it, we abandoned it for some reason. I don't know why. That's the part I couldn't remember. I looked it up. I, yeah, I don't like, remember. I, why. I was in the room, and I don't remember why we abandoned it. Yeah. So there was something, like, that it got stuck up in. So I would like try to find out, I'll talk to somebody who worked on it right at the time and see why they abandoned it. Yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> okay. No, no, it's more than that. It's, it's more than that. So, uh, okay. So uh, yeah, I can ask, I see if there's an issue that kind of didn't make it go forward, but I I'm open to like, kind of like revisiting this and see if it, Actually, we only anything. need a subset of what uh, Ted was doing because we don't need boot P, for instance. It's yeah, yeah, only the exactly, ACP. Yeah. Yeah. A lightweight uh, would work. So, like, so uh, the other question I have is on the side is like, hey, you're saying this is the network for the future. Why doesn't it do V6? Yeah. Right? Like, it's that, that, that would like be my like biggest like thing for that. Right? Like, so it's, uh, yeah, I so. think that you can, the, the big problem uh, with uh, supporting only IPv6 is that you cannot go and force all the Operator that have million of radio installed to change them over IPv6. That, that is, uh, it is quite a strong point. Right. Like, but so, um, so this is like also for legacy radio. You want to go back and that is only something. for legacy radio and for, for operator that have uh, IPv4 on the on that network. So, okay. Because like when I saw ECPRI, I would think like you know you're replacing the RRU and the U, and they're both going to be new, right? That's kind of my underlying assumption. So. Yes and no, because it is not a matter of replacing, it is a matter of uh, doing a software update because there is a lot of things and normally this uh, transceiver, they have, they are not a very powerful device, so they have a little capacity, little CPU and all is working on layer two, so it is only a small channel that does basic operation and maintenance on IP that we exploit to find the the. the the identity of the radio. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, David Lampeter. Uh, Suresh is giving me a great lead in. Uh, there's an RFC for DHCPv4 over DHCPv6. Um, I don't think it currently applies to relay operation, um, but I think what you're asking for is equivalent features as are already there in DHCPv6 for v4. And you are asking for vendors to update the L2 relay agent, right? Because the L2 relay agent would change behavior with your suggestion. 
maybe a better way would be instead to change it in a way that it instead encapsulates the HTTP V4 requests in V6, and you just use the existing infrastructure. Okay. That way, we also get more V6. Well, this, uh, the, 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 the draft is still a draft. It can be done in a number of ways, so ideas are welcome. Please, uh, Yari. Uh, Yari, like one of the co-authors uh, for Claudio's uh, draft. Um, yes, yeah, just sort of highlight wh where we are with this. So this is, we're bringing a, a use case. Um, it's like, you know, one example. Perhaps there might be other examples where this kind of feature would be useful. Um, and we're kind of open on exactly how to go about it. There's sort of some preference that it's somehow related to DHCP, given that the V6 case is already handled through that. And whether it's sort of reviving the old drafts for doing this or, or you know, some carrying uh, V4 in, in V6, um, maybe that's a detail and we, we could talk about that. And, and certainly your, your opinions on that is, is welcome. I was unable to find back the protocol name uh, my first talking. There is something called LLDP. No. Uh, no. Sure, but then LLDP end up into the first switch, exactly, because there's one up on purpose. Then you get tables, and then you can use NetMod or NetCon for SNMP or whatever to grab those information. Yes, we also were thinking about using other things like uh, O&M protocols for that. Mm. It will make things, uh, yeah, it is another approach. So here we are promoting, promoting this approach. That's, it can be done in a different way, yes. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. I think that was everything we had on the agenda. So good job, guys. Got 10 minutes. Um, just quick wrap up things. We're going to send the 8415. This is our, please go look at that working group last call. It ends November 20th. Please get your comments in, take a read of it. Uh, we want to move that along. And then um, Jen's draft. Uh, we'll do a working group last call on that next week after we wrap up this week. And I think everything else, take a look at those two drafts that we talked about today. I think there was a lot of good feedback. I don't have anything else. Does anyone have anything? All right, we'll close it down. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bernie. So, Bernie, how long have you been chair of DHC? I don't recall. <laughs> you can't even remember. <laughs> yeah, it's so long ago. I don't know. We'd have to go back to the, the records. Oh, but wow. not as long as Routh. I think Routh has still got everybody beat. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you. Good, yeah, good to see you guys. All right, take care. Have a great day. Yeah, it is. And there are a few holes in the notes, so if, if people could take a quick look and fill in the gaps, that would be great. Thank you. I don't know if you do want to. I guess you can like just say what he said. But I think he's sort of coming around a little bit. So, yeah, we'll wrap up this stuff. I'll see if I can grab. I'll send him a note, actually. He's in. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah